Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Delivering Virtual Care, the Future of Oncology Disease Management. My name is Denise Heaney, and I'm a Senior Scientific Affairs Manager supporting Roche Diagnostic Information Solutions. I would like to extend a thank you to all for taking the time and joining us today. Today, we'll be discussing virtual care for oncology patients. We will hear how the University of Missouri has been driving virtual care through virtual tumor boards and discuss best practices for virtual meetings. Amongst the COVID-19 pandemic, we find ourselves in a unique time with unique circumstances. And this requires us to think differently and approach things differently. We know despite the times we're in, cancer care doesn't stop. And because of that, we need tools to make sure we can deliver care to patients. We need to explore new modalities to deliver that care. Virtual care and telemedicine can serve as a lifeline to the care patients need. The three pillars of healthcare, cost, quality, and access to care, reducing costs while increasing quality with access to care for all. These are all what we strive for, and virtual care offers great promise in all three of these pillars. It is with pleasure that I introduce our panel today, Dr. Adam Dicker, Enterprise Senior Vice President, Professor and Chair of Radiation Oncology at Thomas Jefferson, and Director for the Jefferson Center for Digital Health and Data Science. Dr. Richard Hammer, Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs and Pathology and Anatomic, Anatomical Sciences at University of Missouri. Also joining us today on this panel is Mr. Chris Blackburn, Communications Business Partner at Roche Diagnostics. I will now turn it over to Dr. Dicker. Dr. Dicker, please continue. Thank you. Um, let's see if I got control now. Okay, sorry. So, so just as a background, um, uh, Jefferson is a medium to large healthcare system and is based in Philadelphia and uh, also in New Jersey. We have about 16 hospitals over a million outpatient visits, um, and um, the perspectives I provide are coming from a solid tumor uh, perspective, and, and uh, I, Dr. Hammer's in my mutual admiration society and really is at the forefront of leading the virtual tumor boards, and his particular expertise is in the liquid tumors and all the genomics that relate to that. And I'm going to give you my perspective. Uh, I'm at work today. I'm seeing patients, and um, and really the intersection of, of what's gone on um, during this pandemic. So, um, you know, digital health encompasses a number of things. This is from the Digital Therapeutic Alliance, and really for today's call, you know, there are uh, a couple of different pieces that come into play. Uh, certainly, there's health information technology and the EMR, which is really you know, the major transaction machine that underpins a lot of uh, almost all healthcare today. There's the uh, consumerism aspect in terms of how most of America, and I'll highlight this in the next slide or two, you know, has some sort of device uh, that allows them to communicate with providers, not everyone, but most. I think um, on the upper right, um, we talk about um, uh, clinical decision support, and this pandemic has really had an explosion of information that um, whether you're coming from a oncology um, delivery care or pathology perspective, um, the cognitive overload uh, on top of the usual cognitive overload in a uh, dynamic world of oncology, particularly um, in this current uh, pandemic, has really um, pushed many of us to the limit, and having clinical physician support that can uh, bring in different types of data, I think, is going to be more and more important. And the last is really the telehealth, which is um, from provider uh, to patient and also from provider to provider, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, on, the, on the patient side, there was a publication from um, uh, the Obama administration, which is really data rich in terms of um, how the disparities are, are becoming less and less uh, with different types of devices and how uh, people in the United 
States, whether it's rural or urban, whether it's lower socioeconomic or higher socioeconomic, you know, how it really is converging. Um, we don't have a similar type of publication that looks at how healthcare on the provider side uh, has changed, but this really has a huge amount of information. And really, what all we're trying to do um, as we use different aspects of digital health is really obviously uh, try to improve outcomes for patients. Uh, we're looking to reduce the burnout, um, which is becoming real for healthcare providers. We're looking how to really democratize healthcare. And I think what virtual tumor boards start doing, and, and Dr. Hammer is going to show a very challenging case, is really how you can democratize using this type of technology in clinical decision support. Um, so, you know, there are two uh, take home points um, in the next two slides. So, you know, what took many, many years uh, to get off the ground, you know, as Eric Topol mentioned in a couple different uh, tweets, you know, this has really been an accelerant. And um, whereas places who hadn't been doing telehealth or, or telemedicine, you know, quickly had to get up to speed, fortunately, uh, we've been doing it for four or five years right now. In fact, as a chair, one of my um, metrics of performance and my uh, compensation depends actually on my telehealth uh, metrics, and that's been going on for a number of years. So uh, it's been much easier for us to transition, but you know, this is now the new normal. I think there's, uh, I mentioned in the third bullet, uh, the, being able to keep up with information has been incredibly challenging. And the payment um, has now, you know, changed. Uh, the second part is patients' expectations are now changed. Um, medical education has changed. There's huge opportunities for precision oncology. Um, and really, hospitals are no longer the sanctuary site for supportive care. Uh, hospitals are now an iatrogenic risk, um, you know, for patients. Um, and then there's a whole issue about cancer patients and COVID, et cetera, that many people are aware of. And, and also another aspect of precision oncology is going to be inborn errors of immunity. And, and I think the genie's out of the bottle and there is no going back. Um, telemedicine is not new. It's been going on for <clears throat> a number of decades and, and it really is the new normal. Um, this is what, you know, this is, purely self-promotion from a Jefferson perspective. This is what the consumer patient, you know, is seeing. Um, we do this with very advanced patients and cancer and every aspect of, of healthcare. And, um, and, you know, all of us are getting more refined in the way we conduct our telehealth uh, visits. Um, there are a number of um, myths that we had to overcome. You know, it's too hard. Well, you know, it's, you know, in the United Kingdom, they couldn't get telehealth off the ground. And all of a sudden, in, in you know, March and April, boom, it happened. So I guess it wasn't too hard. Uh, I think this myth about priori prioritizing relationships over transactional care has changed. Uh, the physical exam, you can do many aspects of a physical exam. The effectiveness, I think, has been dispelled. And CMS in three different rulings has also uh, this bust this uh, bubble, uh, you know, this myth about there's no business model. Um, you know, it, it's just another tool in delivering healthcare. And I think virtual um, tumor boards is another aspect of just delivering, you know, healthcare. Um, Dr. Hammer is going to talk about really clinician to clinician, which, you know, telepathology, virtual tumor boards, um, you know, is on the left. Um, there's obviously provider to patient, and then there's the consumer stuff. And, and I think all of this is really normal now, and, and telehealth is really just health. Um, this is, you know, definitely changed. You know, we're now planning on what do we do post-surge? How do we uh, schedule, you know, all the elective surgery? There's an enormous amount of work going on at different healthcare centers at different parts of the country trying to figure out um, pre-admission testing, what do waiting rooms look like, you know, and by the way, although the focus is on the current crisis, in the back of our minds, we all are concerned about what happens if there's a resurgence 
you know, in the fall winter, right? In 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 um, in the commercial sector, they talk about business continuity plans. Uh, in healthcare, that's not a phrase we use frequently, uh, but I think all of us are are you know we need a plan in place that you know for any sort of disaster, so we can go you know virtual. We're not turning back in terms of the way we're doing tumor boards. We're you know once we got and enjoyed uh, the virtual tumor boards and participated in one. Today in genital urinary, we had we went over 25 cases in an hour. There were 35 participants. We're not going back. I mean, we'll still have in person, but we'll also provide virtual as well. Um, you know, this is you know BC before COVID and and AC after COVID, and all of us across the nation, you know, are experiencing this, and at least. Um, I don't know if everyone is moving to virtual tumor boards, but Dr. Hammer has been at the forefront of this, and he'll share his experiences shortly. Um, I think the issue about data is oncology has lacked in, in this particular aspect. Um, I had a conversation with the head of solid tumor medical oncology today about how not all our tumor boards are operating at the same level virtually, and the quality is not the same, and I think we and, and, you know, looking to Dr. Hammer for guidance, we'll be trying to, you know, determine what are the quality metrics uh, for this. And, and I think uh, in many aspects of oncology care, you know, there'll be data that'll be coming out and they will be providing guidance. I think the goal is not to reduce the interaction with patients. I think, you know, ultimately the goal with clinical decision support, virtual tumor board, telehealth, uh, remote monitoring, et cetera, you know, is ultimately to provide more face time with patients and ultimately uh, to increase empathy. So I'm appreciative of, of the opportunity to um, be part of this today, and um, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Dicker. Um, we will now transition over um, to Dr. Hammer and hear about the University of Missouri. Okay, hello everybody, and thanks, Dr. Dicker, for that great uh, presentation and overview. So I'd like to talk <clears throat> a little bit about what we're doing here at the University uh, of Missouri. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, we've been doing uh, virtual tumor boards pretty much from uh, uh, day one of the crisis, uh, and it was actually a very interesting experience. Uh, for me because, of course, we've been uh, working uh, with Navify now for quite some time and also had on our roadmap of doing virtual tumor boards, but I was literally asked to do this overnight. Uh, uh, we accelerated from a level one kind of status at the hospital to a level three in about a day, and I was asked about <clears throat> noon on Tuesday to present a tumor board virtually on Wednesday. Uh, at eight o'clock and it we actually did and it went very well uh, but we were kind of sort of primed and ready to go but it was also some interesting discoveries here uh, along the way and one of those is that we live in a virtual world but not everybody knows how to live in it so some of our clinicians are not as adept at virtual tumor boards and software as others uh, and so there may be a little learning curve there for them we don't really need any extra preparation time for the tumor board. We actually prepare the same way, whether we're doing it virtually or live in person. Case discussions can proceed as usual. Uh, it takes a little practice and a tiny bit of change in format, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, initially in our planning, we thought that when we reached a level three status, we would cancel tumor boards because we would be too busy with other things, but we really quickly found out there was no need to do that. So we have continued our regular uh, uh, lineup of tumor boards. We do a 10 a week, uh, and we're doing all of them uh, virtually now. So with a little practice uh, and a little uh, planning, uh, the transition to a virtual format can be pretty easy. So what are the challenges, though, to implement a virtual tumor board? Uh, and there are some. Uh, of course, we were sort of ready to go at the drop of a hat because we were on that pathway anyway. Uh, one thing to consider is whether your platform is HIPAA compliant. We use a HIPAA compliant version of Zoom. 
So you probably need to consult with your legal and compliance people and make sure that uh, everything is uh, okay with them and also with your IT security to make sure that you have a secure system. One of the things we really noticed uh, initially was there were hardware issues. Uh, you know, I work at a university and we have uh, sort of the standard Windows computers and they don't have cameras and they don't necessarily have microphones. So some people were found uh, quickly uh, on that they didn't really have the right setup to do virtual tumor boards. And so we had to solve that. Uh, and then it's a lot of change management like everything else. It's a new piece of software. It's a new workflow. It's a new process. People had to learn how to do it and make the transition to do it. Uh, and once they did, in a few weeks, uh, everything is running very smoothly now. <clears throat> it also, uh, there were some initial sort of uh, issues and things to consider about running the tumor board, such as learning how to do screen sharing. However, I'd have to say when we first started, the audio issues and the lack of people being familiar with how to sign in onto a virtual platform uh, was really the number one issue that uh, we had to solve. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what are the keys to success for a virtual tumor boards? Well, one of them initially when you implement is to have a well-trained moderator or a host who can facilitate uh, the discussion and who's presenting. We have a very uh, sort of I wouldn't say rigid, but a standard way of how we present cases in a tumor board. We typically start with the clinical history and the clinician presenting a case, and that's followed then by the radiology, that's followed by pathology, and then there is a relatively open discussion uh, touching all the specialties about uh, what we should do next in the patient care. Uh, so having a moderator who can facilitate the discussion and maybe direct people to respond uh, and, uh, you know, when it's their turn to speak or ask their opinion is, is a really uh, key thing to running a virtual kind of tumor board. You're going to have to provide some user support, at least initially, until people get familiar with whatever platform it is you're using. And everyone, in, uh, every platform is a little different. It takes a little practice learn where all the buttons are, learn how to screen share, learn where the audios are. Once people get used to it, and if you do have a, a host that can help facilitate that, things move very quickly and are very uh, smooth. We actually have had here in place a nurse navigator whose sole job is to manage tumor boards. So we have trained a point person here to schedule meetings, host the meetings, and make sure that everybody receives calendar invites so it's very easy for them to access the tumor board from wherever they are. All they really need to go to do is access their calendar and click on the invitation and click on the link in the invitation. It, it is very simple and uh, uh, seamless for them to do it that way and they can even do it from their phone if they're traveling or in their cars. So if you utilize a technology and stick to a platform that you're comfortable with and everybody soon uh, it becomes comfortable for them and everything runs pretty much like it would as if everybody were gathering in a conference room. So I would say to pick a platform and adopt it, uh, but there are some considerations. Uh, again, we'll talk a little bit about HIPAA and whether you have a secure environment versus a non-secure environment here at the University of Missouri. We actually have three systems. Uh, we have one that's used for sort of undergraduate lectures and education and sort of analogous to the typical account you can just sign in on the internet versus one in the hospital here that is a secure uh, environment and HIPAA compliant uh, so that we use that for patient information. Another consideration that may occur, although we didn't really have this issue, is a bandwidth issue. If everybody's using a virtual uh, solution in your environment, is there too many people on there at one time? And again, personal versus corporate accounts, I would suggest a corporate account that is owned by the hospital and secured by hospital uh, IT uh, rather than people accessing through a personal account. Next slide, please. All right.
So what I'm going to do now is give a little presentation of uh, Navify and how we use it in our tumor boards. This is actually a uh, not a real patient so for those who uh, may have some concern. This is a totally uh, fictitious patient that we have made up. And our platform, of course, is using uh, uh, Navify uh, and uh, on a Zoom uh, secure platform. And <clears throat> we will start the presentation here and run through just a single case uh, just to give an example. So the first case that we may show here would be a 72-year-old uh, female who came to the GYN clinic with an enlarging uterine mass. And she had a history of a superficial low-grade bladder cancer. Uh, back in 2010, had some issues of incontinence, and at that time showed a 12-week gestation uh, size uterus that was mobile and uh, non-tender and thought to be a fibroid at the time. Uh, additional studies were performed, and several months later, she had another pelvic exam showing enlargement, uh, and a pelvic ultrasound was performed. This showed a uh, mass, which was cystic, uh, that measured up to seven centimeters in size. And at this point, there was concern that this mass represented a malignancy such as a uterine myomyosarcoma, which is a relatively uh, uncommon uh, tumor. So she was scheduled for a, a hysterectomy. So again, her past medical history was that of a superficial bladder cancer, no other cancer history. Uh, she never smoked, <coughs> excuse me, and had only moderate uh, alcohol use. And I'll let Dr. Dicker explain uh, what he sees here on uh, ultrasound. Yeah, so so just, um, so the information uh, from the EMR was brought into this clinical decision support tool. No one had to type this in. Um, I When I was reviewing, I'm going to pretend to be the radiologist here, but when I was reviewing this case earlier, I pinned these images so that um, I don't have to search through, I don't have to go into the PAC system, you know, pull up all the different imaging on different dates and then find the suitable image. I just pinned it as I was reviewing the case as I was doing my regular job and then it automatically got put into Navify. So anyway, this is showing a, a complex mass. It, it shows both cystic and um, non-cystic uh, aspects of it. It shows post-acoustic shadowing, there's suggestion of hemorrhage uh, in the mass, and the size, uh, um, you know, it's a considerable size. Uh, can't exactly measure it right now, but it's, whatever, it's at least uh, six, eight uh, centimeters in size. Okay, so the patient then went to surgery and had a, a hysterectomy. It showed a fleshy tan tumor here with hemorrhage and demarcation of the tumor from the underlying myometrium. Microscopically, we can see this is composed of smooth muscle, which is hypercellular, and atypical with some varying size nuclei, like we see here. And this was a uh, diagnostic of a uh, lyomyosarcoma. Given the patient's uh, age, we actually use the apps present within uh, Navify to find a clinical trial that this patient actually may qualify for. Uh, during the tumor board to show uh, there may be a chemotherapy option uh, in a patient with a high-risk uterine myo myosarcoma previously removed by surgery. She was uh, staged then as a clinical stage 1B and a pathologic stage 1B. <clears throat> and we also found doing a PubMed search using the apps present within Navify that uh, there may be some new technology that we can do to give some prognostic indicators of her chances of recurrence in uh, death in uterine myomyosarcomas. The next thing we wanted to do was uh, document what we might want to do next for this patient. And so using the next steps features here, we could uh, document that maybe we need to do molecular testing such as NGS and see if this patient qualifies for the match trial. And also, since she's not have extensive radiology uh, done, maybe she needs a PET scan to see if there's a 
uh, chance the uh, tumor has uh, metastasized. So this is just a overview and an example of uh, some of the things that uh, we can do. And of course, we do this all for uh, pretty much every patient in our tumor board. And of course, uh, can use these apps and clinical trial match features to uh, uh, document and record and actually discuss uh, the possibility of clinical trials and additional therapies during uh, our tumor board. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Hammer. Now we're um, gonna transition over to Chris Blackburn to provide some tips and tricks for virtual meetings. Well, hello there, everyone, um, and excited to uh, have the opportunity to share some just high-level best practices for uh, executing virtual meetings, um, regardless um, of what platform you're utilizing. You know, as we continue to advance into this really new way of communicating and connecting on more of a virtual scale, the, the successful utilization of this type of meeting space is absolutely critical um, to ensuring the impact and the usefulness of each engagement that you guys have. You know, here at Roche, um, we have multiple field-based employees that we engage with on a daily basis um, who are uh, field-based um, across all these different platforms. And it's our goal uh, to make sure that those that are remote feel like they're connected just as closely as those that are sitting in the room. Um, so, so as you guys can see here on the slide, we just have some high-level best practices that uh, we just want to talk through with you briefly today. So um, jumping right in as we look at, you know, understanding the platform you're using, um, both from a presenter and a user standpoint, you know, um, sometimes it's easy just to, to, to open up one of these and jump right in when the user does as well. But um, the reality is we, we want to make sure that we really understand the platform and um, we know all the tools. Um, one thing we recommend is that you schedule a practice session at least 24 hours prior to the event for yourself, for um, the other moderators or whoever else is going to be on the call with you so you guys understand the tools available within the system and how um, the manual controls work, the comments work, muting, screen sharing, all these different things um, that by knowing your technology, um, you'll understand it and you'll, you'll have a much smoother and impactful engagement with those that you're communicating with. Um, the other thing we say is Google is your friend. Um, YouTube is actually your best friend. You know, search for um, best practices on how to maximize the specific platform that you're utilizing. Um, there are video tips out there. There's there's trick tools, all kinds of things where people have mastered these these platforms. It'll give you um, you know a, a little more insight in, into ways to make it a great experience. You know, with technology, there's always glitches. Um, but the better we understand the platform the easier we can adjust and pivot and make sure it's a, a very impactful session for, for those that you're engaging with. Um, as we look at meeting etiquette, um, I think all of us realize we don't want to start a meeting with the rules, but, but it's not rude to start the meeting with just some ground, um, I'll say rules again, and recommendations that will just ensure a quality experience. And the number one thing is, is making sure everybody on the line is muted. You know, it's, it's one of the most common interferences in, in a virtual meeting session. Um, there are some streaming services that don't allow others to communicate, but most do, and most do not default to a, a standard mute setting. So um, understanding how to mute yourself, mute your fellow panelists, mute those that are in the audience um, is absolutely critical just to make sure that the content can be focused and you don't have those um, unintentional interruptions. I, I tell the story um, that I once sat through a 90-minute presentation with a gentleman who was also on the call off of mute while flying on a plane. Um, and, and you can imagine the, the distraction that that causes. I, I can't tell you what the presentation was about, what the key objectives or the take-home points were. Um, all I remember is the sound of the jet engine um, through the line. And that's not the takeaway in the experience that you want your attendees to have. Um, one other thing in this area you know, is have your presentation up ready to go. One of the most unprofessional things that we can do um, is to, to log in late or at the exact same time as our attendees where they get to watch you open your desktop, they get to see all your icons, the picture of your dog in the background. Um, it's, it's really critical that we are in, we have a nice hold screen ready to go um, so that attendees are welcomed um, and they, they don't have any concern they're in the wrong place and they can really just kind of set a standard for the level of quality of what this presentation will be. Um, and then lastly, um, set expectations early on engagement. Um, most people are going to come in wanting to have some kind of dialogue. They might have questions. They might have some hot topics they want to discuss with you. 
Um, if you help them understand how they'll be engaged with and how they can communicate with you, um, that will relieve that um, question and allow them to focus on the content knowing that they're going to be able to engage with you. Um, from, from an audio standpoint, you know, there's that debate of do I use a laptop or do I call in from my phone? I think um, and Dr. Hammer in his presentation had a great visual of, of what it looks like to have a, a nice headset with a microphone. You know, I'm sitting here using an old Apple iPhone um, cord that has a microphone close to my face. Um, and that's, I think that's critical to make sure that you have a mic close to your mouth. Um, if you use like the desktop mic or the audio there, you're going to hear every pen click, table tap, um, like my neighbor's dog barking outside right now, you'll hear all that even over top of some of your own audio. So you want to make sure you just create a good experience there. And same thing on the phone. Um, nothing wrong with calling in on the phone. Um, however, make sure that you have your computer audio shut off. You have the volume controls down so you don't get that, um, that interference or that delayed audio where you get to listen to yourself speak just a couple seconds after you just said something. So just, just a few audio ideas. And, and lastly, around engagement. Um, you know, there are so many unique ways to engage your audience on these kind of sessions. And one of the, the biggest challenges with virtual meetings is that risk of people multitasking or minimizing your presentation because you don't have eyes on them and doing something else while they listen in. So creating unique ways for them to engage and interact with you is critical to keep people, people motivated to be a part of the session. And, and just a few ideas of, of things you can do is to create a, a live polling segment. Um, these can be easily embedded into the PowerPoint or into the software itself and just give people a chance to give feedback as you go along. This allows you to collect um, data to interact with and maybe um, brings up some hot topics that you guys can engage with. Um, another one and one that we practice at Roche a lot is to send out with the invitation um, a poll or an opportunity, a form of some sort where people can ask questions or submit, hey, here's some things I'd like to talk about on the call. This gives you a chance to really structure the content um, and filter in questions as you go more proactively um, and avoid uh, some of those interruptions or allow you to focus more on the content and limit the Q&A at the end because you have some of that up front. Um, you know, and one of the things we always say is to utilize those tools in the systems. You know, there, there's um, raise of hand, there's a comment box, there's all kinds of tools um, that you can use. And, and I would always recommend having someone, a colleague or somebody join you on the call as a moderator um, that while you're presenting could potentially be answering questions in the comment box or if someone raises their hand, um, they could call on them on their behalf or ask the question on their behalf, again, to avoid three or four people jumping off and you're all ready to ask a question at the same time. This will just give you a little more structure, um, but also put a second set of eyes on um, the content that's being passed back and forth. So, so with that, um, I hope that gives you just a little insight and some best practices that will help ensure a successful session for your, you and your attendees. And, um, I'd actually like to turn the attention back to Dr. Hammer and Dr. Dicker and, and acquire some of their best practices that they utilize. So, um, gentlemen, thank you again for your time and for uh, the great content earlier. And Dr. Hammer, I'll start with you. Um, how do you prepare for a virtual meeting versus an in-person type meeting? Well, actually, uh, you know, we've been using Navify now for a few years, and uh, our preparation really is no different to do a virtual tumor board now than it was for us to do a tumor board uh, within, uh, just say, a conference room. Uh, you know, our, here at the University of Missouri, our pathology residents are uh, sort of a mainstay in preparing the tumor boards. And uh, uh, instead of doing a PowerPoint now, we use Navify and are able to uh, pin the information. Uh, much of the information is actually downloaded automatically into Navify now uh, as we have integration with our EMR. Uh, and so it actually makes the whole process much smoother. The only difference really that we had to do was to take it to a virtual platform and that happened uh, very easily and very quickly. So Dr. Hammer, I'll stay with you. Um, you know, what, what has been the reason the virtual tumor boards at your institution have been so successful? Well, I think one of the reasons uh, was sort of our uh, long-standing experience with using Navify in a virtual, potential virtual platform anyway, but also when we made the transition, one of the best uh, uh, and most helpful things is to have a moderator uh, that is familiar with the software and can help facilitate uh, the meeting and direct people and include everybody that needs to be included in a discussion and then help people get familiar with uh, the environment. Okay, so Dr. Dicker, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you here. Um, you know, in regards to medical education, 
Um, how are you using virtual connectivity to drive this? Yeah, so med education, you know, is both at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level. I, I agree with Dr. Hammer. Our trainees are actively involved <clears throat> in, within all the different uh, specialties and subspecialties. Uh, nothing has really changed. Um, in terms of um, adapting to telehealth, again, it's, it's just another tool that you just have to uh, be comfortable with and learn how to use. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm evolving in the way I practice and incorporate information. Um, I, you know, one comment I'll make about our virtual tumor board today is, is compared to a year ago, we have better participation because we're virtual than when we're in person. And I think it's the um, it's the ease of accessibility. I think it's uh, not having to squint at uh, for some of us who might be a little older at an LCD screen, and and you really see the pathology and radiology up front. I mean, our radiologist is working from their home. The pathologist happened to be in the hospital. The oncologist, some of us were, um, you know, in our respective offices. Some of us were at home, but. Um, so I think all of us are, are, you know, quickly, you know, changing. And again, we're not going back. This is the, the new, you know, platform from which we're going to work. Uh, I got to second that, actually. Since we started this, uh, we've actually had people uh, email me and contact me and asking me, can we not go back? Uh, in other words, they want to preserve the virtual tumor board. Uh, because they find it much simpler, and again, uh, I support uh, in second what Dr. Dicker says, that we've actually had more people involved attending tumor boards than typically might show up in a conference room, because a virtual platform makes it a little easier for them to attend from wherever they are. Yeah, and, and we had uh, a urologist today from a hospital that's part of our system, 40 minutes away by car, and... Um, you know, he had questions on a particular difficult case, and, and it was great that he could participate. I don't think he's ever participated before in, in such a tumor board. So um, the inclusivity is, is really incredible. Okay, so Dr. Dicker, you know, in, a, in an in-person meeting, um, you have that opportunity to read the body language of an individual and see those visual cues. Um, how do you overcome this in a virtual setting? Yeah, so, you know, some people are going to be more comfortable uh, turning their cameras on and some aren't. And, um, you know, we have 7,500, you know, licenses for Zoom. So uh, many of us uh, had a chairs meeting today at 7 a.m. with the chief medical officer. And, uh, you know, so we're all using the chat function, raising hands. And, you know, so you adapt. Uh, you, it, it, it is difficult to read the room and every, if you have your camera turned off. Uh, people can participate in, uh, you know, using the chat function. Uh, so I think there's, uh, I was on a meeting last night with one of the, um, I participate, I have a leadership role in NRG Oncology, one of the NCI cooperative groups. Uh, so we had a leadership meeting and, and the person was running a poll. Let's say there were 20 people on, on the, Zoom call last night that was being presented in a format, and and throughout the um, discussions, uh, there was a poll being presented, and you would answer online. I mean, we didn't show a poll today in the tour board, but you know, those things can easily be um, uh, incorporated in terms of getting recommendations on a should they go on this trial or that trial, or would you use this therapeutic approach or that therapeutic approach, right? Um, um, so. Um, you adapt. So, gentlemen, I'll ask the million-dollar question here. Um, you know, in the virtual setting, what do you do when there is that awkward silence? Well, I would say that uh, that is partly the role of the moderator and the facilitator or the meeting host uh, is to uh, kind of direct people to when is it your turn to talk. Sometimes using a virtual setting, uh, it, it, it's easy to try to talk over somebody or two people, three people start talking all at once. And again, I would say having a host who or is a meeting uh, leader, uh, whether it be a clinician or depends. Uh, here we have a, a sort of a clinician head for each of our tumor board. 
and I've asked them to sort of take charge and be the be the moderator and kind of direct the traffic a little bit uh, and make sh make sure things uh, move along smoothly. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, there's a a couple of different approaches. I think uh, the conversation I had with the head of uh, Solid Tumor Medical Oncology today was that we should be looking. I challenged uh, this individual. I said we should be looking to treat the virtual tumor board as a leadership opportunity, right? Um, and and not just treat it as oh yeah you know we're gonna. But but you know I think this is something that you can grow into, you can train towards, and um, and then as I mentioned earlier, um, not all our tumor boards that are being run virtually are at the same caliber. And um, uh, so I think the goal is to, to figure out how to harmonize and, and no one, you know, no one was taught this in school. And to be frank, no one was taught in their training how to run an in-person tumor board. So I, I think, you know, that's one issue. Number two, um, you know, our challenge is to go through all the cases in that hour and you know, if you're at a smaller institution that may not have as much, um, you know, here we're very site specific at the University of Missouri. They're very site disease site specific. Uh, some community uh, locations may um, have different uh, diseases presented in the same tumor board. Some may not have enough to occupy quote an hour. So then you can um, use the time to talk about an interesting paper or you know, some aspect of precision oncology or, you know, or things that relate to COVID-19, you know, that's uh, relevant, you know, for oncology. So, uh, although I was responsible last week for um, a 90-second pregnant pause and, and you know, I'm uh, embarrassed about that, um, I think with, as Dr. Hammer mentioned, you know, a good moderator, um, you know, would make sure that that uh, dead air, that that silence, is kept to a minimum. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you um, very much again for for the great insight. And just a, a note to all those that are attending here before uh, I would hand this back over to uh, Denise. Um, you know, the importance of virtual care and virtual tumor boards is critical uh, during this time to continue care for our patients and. Um, currently, we're offering the use of Navify Tumor Board at no charge for the next three months for you and your institution. You know, this would allow you and your care team to access the software and utilize it for virtual tumor board, virtual tumor board, excuse me, case reviews, second opinions, clinical trial matching, and digital guidelines and other use cases. Um, our training and implementation is all done virtually um, to help your care team every step of the way. So after this webinar, you will receive an email with a link to sign up. Um, or feel free to visit Navify.com to learn more. And Denise, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar and a special thanks to our panel for sharing uh, your expertise with us. It was incredibly informative and enlightening. And, you know, we, in the discussion, we know that telemedicine has always been something that has been talked about. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, what we have seen, and you guys uh, spoke to it incredibly well, is a rapid and radical transformation to telehealth and telemedicine. And, and you know, I believe um, in your words, Dr. Dicker, this will be the new normal going forward. Um, one of the things that we've seen is we've witnessed the regulatory bodies enabling ways to make this actually happen, including that of reimbursements for virtual care, which one is that once upon a time was something that we just thought would happen and not thinking it would happen as quickly as it had. So this has been monumental and will allow for us to have this continuous continuation of virtual care even after the pandemic is over. As, as Chris mentioned, you will be receiving an email after the webinar. Um, it will have several pieces of information, including um, a contact in the event that you have questions. Um, please feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to um, address any questions that you may have. We, again, appreciate your time today and hope that everyone stays safe and healthy. Thank you to everyone. <laughs>